Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to have you here uh, again with us uh, this afternoon uh, for the next session in the Charmwood Forest Species Identification and Recording uh, webinars. Um, today, um, we're absolutely really lucky to have uh, Dr. Helen O'Brien here, um, who is the County Mammal Recorder, the Vice County Mammal Recorder. She's going to be giving us an introduction to mammal field signs. So as before, we are recording the session. Um, so if you could make sure you're on mute uh, until we get to the end of the question section, um, feel free to have your cameras on or off. It's completely up to you. Um, we will have some time for questions at the end. Uh, and as ever, um, we hope to finish by around two o'clock. Um, oh, sorry, uh, we just skipped on, to the, skipped on to the next slide. Um, so just a reminder um, that the whole project is about species identification and recording. Um, and there's loads of information on the website. I'm sure most of you will have received the link by now. Um, if you haven't, I'll be sending that round at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Helen, um, who's going to take us through an introduction to mammal identification field signs. Um, so looking forward to uh, an hour or so um, of a bit different uh, this month. So thanks very much for joining us, Helen. Uh, if okay. you'd like to start sharing, yeah, I will we'll do. stop mine. Oh, sorry. I'll just go back, <laughs> back a slide. There we go. Yeah, thanks very much, everybody, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here today to uh, be able to talk to you and uh, to hopefully share some of my knowledge with you and that you can take away and uh, look around the Charnwood Forest area and into the wider uh, Leicestershire and Rutland counties so that we can boost our, our mammal records. Um, just Sorry to, to interrupt, Helen, we just need your screen share. Sorry. Oh, we just sorry. Need your right. screen, I yeah. thought. I thought you. I thought. Sorry. That's Let me okay. just end that. And uh, I was away. I'd started. So yeah, I'm sorry. Start, yeah. isn't it? There we go. I thought it was a bit strange. It has to be. How's that, everybody? Can everybody see that? That is spot on. Thanks, Helen. I will, brilliant. Uh, and you can you hear me you okay, time. can you? Yes, all good. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, then. Right, I will start all over again then. Uh, so, yeah, um, as Claire introduced me, I'm Helen O'Brien. I've been the County Mammal Recorder for the VC55 area. That covers Leicestershire and Rutland for over 10 years now. Um, and a, a large part of that remit is about encouraging people to record mammals across those two counties and um, to really raise awareness of mammals and how endangered some of those mammals are. Um, so actually being invited here today to, to share that knowledge with you and to hopefully encourage um, you to go out and to, to find the mammal tracks and signs yourselves and, and to um, record them, it, it obviously, fulfills a, a lot of what we're trying to achieve. So again, thank you very much for, for giving me that opportunity today. Um, just to go through what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, just a very brief introduction about why, why we actually bother recording mammals in the first place. Um, I'm going to also talk about some of the field study signs uh, and guides that are out there. Um, there's a lot of information. Uh, so obviously you can take away what uh, what I provide today and the, the presentation will be on uh, the, um, the web pages from the Charmwood Forest uh, project, um, but there is an awful lot of information out there. I'm going to talk about some of the equipment that you might find useful when you go out on site. Um, and then really it's down to the nitty gritty of looking at some of the, the field signs. Um, and what I've tried to do is actually break it down into species groups rather than actually go through, well, this is a fox print, this is a badger print, this is an otter print, etc. Because I think it's quite important that when you're going out, you actually are putting together pieces of a jigsaw in trying to identify what type of mammal it is and not just rely on one uh, field sign to, to make your deduction of what that, that animal is that you're, you're trying to identify. 
So uh, there's a whole list of reasons why we, we might want to record mammals. Uh, I think the main one really is, is that uh, probably with most of you joining the uh, presentation today, it's because we actually enjoy going out and looking at nature anyway. And uh, we, you know, we want to find, we're inquisitive people and we want to find out, you know, what is actually out there and, and using our gardens and our local green spaces. Um, the important thing is, I think, though, is to realise that the information that we're gathering does have a knock on effect and it can have a very positive effect because we can help to conserve our animals by understanding how well they're distributed, uh, whether the populations are going up and down, um, how that might influence some of the development going on in the area and how mitigation might be required if there are particular species in that area. So it is going to have you know, a huge effect if, if more of us are actually going out and recording these species. And the other more proactive, positive way is that we can work with landowners um, and work with people who, who have their own houses and gardens to help them manage areas uh, better or to, to plant up hedgerows or tree areas um, or to uh, leave uh, grass a bit longer. And that will help all sorts of mammals and that will then obviously have a, a knock on effect on the larger ecosystem. So helping to connect areas from one area to another is also a big uh, part of us helping to record uh, the mammal populations. So just to put things into context as well, uh, obviously we are mammals in our own right and tracking is actually quite an ancient skill. It, it's something that uh, certainly our ancestors did a long, long time ago as hunter gatherers. And um, perhaps it's in our DNA that this is what we want to do. We want to find out what is out there and, and actually being able to identify mammals can actually be considered a reasonably sort of complex and, and specialist process because we need to be able to identify what the print looks like just by the pattern of it. And, and each mammal will have its own unique uh, type of print. Um, and from looking at the patterns, and we need to deduce what, what that animal might be. And, and we can do that by actually considering the, the physiology of the animal. You know, is it a big animal? Is it a small animal? Is it likely to uh, be using certain habitats to, uh, to, to forage and to feed? Um, what's its behaviour like? Does it come out during the day or does it come out at night? Is it fairly wary or is it sort of quite a brazen species? So all these things actually feed into your analysis of what that mammal might be. And I think it's quite important that whenever you try and identify a species, you do it in the most reliable way, um, that we, we have some confidence if somebody is submitting some information that they've actually made the correct identification. So there's no problem at all if you just say, I don't know, I'm just not sure. Uh, because I think one of the concerns is, is that we can misidentify or just almost like suppose uh, that it is, it is a particular animal. And, and the great thing about recording, particularly in, in Leicestershire and Rutland, is that we've got a great set of specialists behind the scenes that can help with the verification process. So we've, we gain confidence in the, in the mammals that are being recorded. And that in itself helps people to, to further develop their own ID skills. So there, are, there is a lot of help out there, as I say, particularly in our counties um, where we've, we've developed the specialist advice. So there's obviously various ways of, of recording mammals, um, direct observation, whether that's through photographs and, and trapping animals, or even seeing them out on the road if they've been uh, killed on the road, um, is, is, is certainly a way of identifying them. And as you're very well aware, um, most of our British mammals are very easy to recognise. You know, the, the hedgehog is unique, the fox is unique, the badgers are unique. So I think actually the, 
the identification of actually seeing an animal isn't too much of a problem for most of our British mammals, but actually the field signs might pose us a, a bit more of a problem. And this is really what we're going to focus on today. Um, going to look at the types of droppings, which can confusingly be called all sorts of different things, um, depending on the animal that's made them. Uh, looking at food remains and prints, um, and looking at where they might be uh, resting up or, or where they actually might breed. Um, there's other field signs like bones and hairs that I will touch on, and also trails and runs, which are the pathways through the vegetation that the mammals make. Um, I'm not particularly going to talk about those today, although it is a very important uh, thing that you need to consider when you're going out um, and, and looking for field signs. It's just that they're actually quite difficult to pick out on a, um, on a photograph. And so actually when doing uh, walks in the future, then hopefully we can, we can go out and we can spot those uh, types of things. Um, I'm just gonna go through a number of guides that you can uh, get hold of fairly readily and at reasonable price. And depending on how much of interest you've got in recording mammals and understanding their behavior, then each of these guides will offer you a different slant to, to what you, you, you want to understand. So the first one, the, the sort of Bible of mammals, I guess, is the mammals of uh, the British Isles. Um, the fourth edition, uh, as shown here on the screen, was actually produced uh, in the mid 1990s. So it's been around for a while. And handbook, I have to say, is a bit of a misnomer because it's incredibly weighty volume. Uh, you certainly need two hands to carry it, um, but it is incredibly detailed. It will tell you all about the physiology of the animal, its behavior, uh, where it's distributed across um, the, sort of the, the world, really. But in our case, it's generally the sort of the northern hemisphere. Um, and all those things are still relevant, even though um, it was written in the 1990s. So it is still the go to book for, for very many uh, mammal specialists. Um, the, the book on the right is a, a good book. It's a, one of a series of the wild guides uh, that has come out. I think the latest one that they've actually produced is one on insects. Um, and this, this particular one, the mammal one, has got um, a new cover uh, of the red squirrel. And the previous version that I've got is, is one with a stoat on it. So if you do see uh, the two when you, you look on Amazon or wherever you want to buy it, then uh, they are actually the same book, but this one's slightly updated. It's got lots of uh, photographs and so lots of details about the, the animals, uh, where they're, what their ecology is, what their habitat is. So it is a useful guide and it comes in a ring bound format as well. So if you did actually want to take it outside with you, um, it's got a waterproof cover and uh, you'd be able to um, take it out on site. Um, this particular guide is uh, written by the PTES or the People's Trust for Endangered Species. And I have to say that this one is, is actually one of the most comprehensive guides in terms of field identification. And that is an example on the right hand side of just how detailed that is. And it goes through each um, animal and each type of um, field sign you'd like to see. Uh, the great thing about this book is that it's actually free and it's available online. So there is the, the link there to, um, to being able to get access to it. Um, and the, the People's Trust for Endangered Species really want to share their knowledge and share their information, which is why they're putting so much of it out um, available on, on the website. So, you know, I, I certainly would recommend that one. Um, the other main go-to for field identification um, are the Field Study Council guides. Um, if you're into nature and you're into recording, then it's, it, you've probably got some in your, in your houses already. Um, in terms of mammals, then they actually do two field guides. One is actually to do with the actual physiology of the, the animal and what it looks like. 
Uh, so if you go out on site, then you will be able to differentiate between, say, a mammal, uh, sorry, a, a, a stoat and a weasel. Uh, but the, there's the other guide, which is the one shown here, which is to do with field signs. And it concentrates quite a lot on the prints um, of which you can see several examples here. Um, but it also goes into details about um, homes and resting places and, and nod hazelnuts and, and various other aspects of it. So it's actually a, a, a quick and easy guide to take out with you, certainly. Uh, when, you, when you're out on site. Um, and it tells you the, um, the, uh, the, the actual dimensions of the, of the prints as well, which is very useful. And last but not least is the uh, Mammal Detective uh, Guide that was written by Rob Strucken, uh, again, a few years ago. And unfortunately, Rob is, is no longer with us, but he was a fantastic naturalist and, and certainly a specialist um, in, in water bowls in particular and led some of the, the national um, uh, surveys uh, across the country. Um, it's, it's a good read because it's actually quite entertaining and it's very anecdotal, uh, but it, it, it provides some very pragmatic uh, and good points about um, going out and looking for mammals. Um, where the, when the best times might be to go out, where to go out and look for certain species. So it, it, it's a good um, entertaining book, but, but you know, full of useful gems as well. So I do like to delve back into that every now and again. Uh, websites are obviously abounding with information. Uh, the go-to ones are nationally are the Mammal Society, uh, it, which is a charity, you can sign up and join the Mammal Society, you can get um, quarterly newsletters from them and you can develop your information and find out about projects that are going on that way. Uh, the People's Trust for Endangered Species, I've already mentioned their website, again lots and lots of information on that. And the Vincent Wildlife, Wildlife Trust tends to concentrate more on research projects um, it's been involved in some national surveys, uh, both for water vole and more recently for pole cats. Um, so it's, it, they will encourage people to be going out and trying to identify a certain particular species if they've got a project in mind. And they usually employ a specialist where you can send specimens to them or you can send photographs and try and get an identification that way. So. They tend to be species that are under-recorded, likely to be endangered, and are difficult to identify. So that's why they, they concentrate and employ specialists. Um, Nature Spot is obviously a very good source to go to. Lots of photographs of mammals on their website. Um, and I think Dave Nichols gave a talk to the group in the last session. So I'm not going to repeat much of, of what what he said in, in so much detail, but a great resource. Um, we have several mammal groups across the two counties as well. Uh, there's the general Leicestershire and Rutland mammal group. Um, there's the hedgehog rescue that obviously concentrates just on hedgehogs, the bat group and the badger group. And really the only mammal of any consequence that we haven't got a group for is the dormouse group. Um, and that's because we haven't got any dormice uh, for the time being anyway. Um, so certainly neighbouring counties do have dormice groups because uh, they've done reintroductions in those areas. Um, but for the time being, they, these are the go-to groups for, for particular projects and, and species um, uh, that they, they specialise in. Uh, a lot of the, the groups have their own websites and because I'm attached specifically to the, uh, to the Leicestershire and Rutland Mammal Group, I just want to say that we've got a Twitter page that uh, you're very welcome. If you're on Twitter, please do join up and follow us. And we've got a Facebook page as well. And um, we will be advertising the various projects and the various walks that we intend to do over the next year and to link in with the national um, projects and surveys that are going on. So this is a great way to meet like-minded people and to, to get involved at very local level. Uh, so all the links are live um, and obviously when they're put on the 
uh, on the web page by uh, Claire, then you'll be able to readily access them. Um, recording mammals, as I said earlier, is a very important way of making sure that what you do record, uh, sorry, what you do identify out on site is actually given some, some credit and actually then helps to contribute to the wider picture. Um, so the Mammal Society have actually created their own um, mammal app that you can download onto your phone. Um, and it provides some uh, basic ID skills as well. Um, and the information goes directly to the Mammal Society and then is shared out more widely uh, with the National Biodiversity Network. So any animals that you do identify will go out and be credited. Um, the good thing about that, that app is that when you start a survey, you can actually start it from the first pace. And then as you go around your route and identify mammals, then you can, you can record it geographically um, exactly where you've seen that, um, that, that particular mammal. It picks up also where you haven't seen things. So as it records your whole route, the Mammal Society are actually interested in where you haven't seen anything, as well as where you have seen stuff. So that's the difference with using that app as opposed to, say, Mammals, uh, sorry, Nature Spot, where um, you can open up the app, you can identify the species, take a, a, a photograph of it, do a, a geolocation, and then pop it on as a record. Um, so that, that is much more specific to, to where you've actually seen it. But they're all fairly good um, ways of actually recording stuff. Obviously, you've got the traditional way of, you know, making a note of it on site and then uh, bringing it uh, back and, and then uploading it onto um, their web pages or alternatively just contacting, uh, in this case, the myself, the, the county mammal recorder, and we will put it onto a database. Um, so there's various ways that you can do that. I've got a quick question mark here because actually um, you don't really need <laughs> any equipment. You need, a, you need your eyes and you need your ears, really. Um, and, uh, but these are all useful bits of equipment to take out. I'd probably say the most important ones are the ruler or something that you can measure the, the field sign. Or you can put the ruler against it and then you can take a photograph of it so that you can put whatever this, the field sign is into context and into, uh, in, into the scale. And that's particularly useful when you're having to send the record off for verification, because the people looking at the photograph will then be able to work out, you know, roughly what size that footprint might be, or, um, you know, how big the pellets are, etc. Um, so a camera is useful and, and certainly on most of our phones, if you take a phone out with you, they've got, you know, really good um, cameras these days. Uh, bags and pots are useful for, for putting samples in. Uh, the gloves might be useful for uh, if you're having to take back vegetation like bramble or, or sedges that can easily cut your hands um, or if you're wanting to actually handle something um, to take a specimen and to to put it into one of the pots you might want to put a pair of gloves on to do that. Uh, the stick uh, isn't really to protect you from the mammals it's more to do with dividing back the vegetation or to poke it in a hole uh, to see how far back it goes um, just to, to, you know, to save your knees or to save your back a lot of the time. Um, but instead of actually sort of picking things up, you might just be able to, to look at things with, with, at a distance with a stick. And the, the hand lens is something that you might be carrying anyway when you're wanting to do some plant identification. But if you're looking at hazelnuts in particular, and depending what your eyesight is like, then you might actually find it a bit easier with the hand lens as well. So I'll, I'll go through um, uh, the use of the hand lens later as well. Um, I put up a, a, a map of the Charmer Forest area uh, with just a list of the, the mammals that have already been recorded there. And you might look at the list and say, oh, well, actually, we don't need to bother them, do we? 
uh, because there's an awful lot of mammals that have been recorded in this area. And the, that's because of the range of habitats that are around. And that actually, a lot of the habitats are, are extremely good for, for, for the mammal populations. What we're not really too good at knowing though is how many mammals we might have got and how well distributed they are. So we might have only got a few um, records of harvest mice, hardly any records of pygmy shrews, um, a few records of stoats and weasels. So it's always good to be able to go out and to get a better understanding. Um, we've got lots of bat records as well. And the one thing that I'm just going to make clear today is that there are certain species that I won't be covering because um, either they're very hard to identify um, out in the field, and this is, for all intents and purposes, an introduction to mammal identification. But also some of the species groups just deserve a whole talk in their own right. And then to, to just try and cover it in, in a few minutes just, just wouldn't be doing them justice. Um, the number of, of mammals here will hopefully give you some confidence that if you do want to go out and you want to concentrate on a particular particular species group or an individual type of species, then you should have more confidence that because they've been recorded there, you will be able to go out and actually find their field signs somewhere if you look in the right place. So the first group of species that I'm just going to cover are the insectivores. So these are the, the mammals that basically eat insects as the main part of their diet. Um, I'm not going to talk about the European mole because the main field sign are mole hills, and I think most of you will know what a mole hill looks like, but it is worth recording where the mole hills are. It creates an, a, a greater picture of just the distribution of these, these animals, and you don't have to count every mole hill, obviously, but uh, if there's a field full of moles, as there are at the moment in some parts of Charmwood, then it might just be worth noting that because, you know, there are, if, if it's a prolific burst in the population, and then a few years down the line, we're hardly seeing any mole hills, that, you know, that might actually be quite an interesting observation. Um, I'm also not going to talk about the other shrews. Um, the lesser white shrew, we don't have in, in uh, this area, uh, they're only found in Jersey. And the greater white shrew is found um, in the other Channel Islands, um, Guernsey and, and Alderney, etc. Um, so we don't have to worry about those. Um, the other shrews uh, do have difficult field signs. And again, it's, it's more a case of going out and, and actually doing surveys for them and using different techniques. So the hedgehog is probably familiar to a lot of you, which is why I've, I've started with this one in particular. Um, the main field signs to identify them by are their prints. And unless they've actually sort of trodden into a bowl of water that you might have put outside for them, and then you can see their little footprints out on your patio, it's actually quite difficult to see these prints. Um, so they've developed a hedgehog tunnel that you can buy online. And it basically is this uh, little contraption on the left hand side and you uh, can cover the area, the, the ink pad with a piece of paper. The hedgehog goes through and creates the prints. And this will clearly show that it's a five-toed animal. It's a small animal, so the prints will be small and it's got sharp claws. Um, so it gives you some confidence that yes, you've got hedgehogs in your garden, if that's what you're not sure about. The other telltale sign is, is the droppings. Um, and they're particularly crinkly, and that's because the amount of insects that they have in them. And often they look quite shiny because you'll be able to see the cases on the outer area of the, of the droppings. So again, a very telltale sign, quite small because of the, the size of the animal. The next big group uh, I'm just going to talk about are the carnivores. And I, I think actually as a species group, these are actually one of my my favorite groups. They seem to be the most wild group of, of mammals that we've got. The wild cat um, in the UK can only be found in Scotland. So if you do see a large cat, like a tub cat, out in, in the open, 
uh, around this area. It could be a feral cat, uh, but it's very, very unlikely to be a wild cat. Um, I'm going to be talking about the red fox, uh, the badgers and the otters. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the other species on this, um, uh, this particular slide here. Again, because they're quite elusive, they've got difficult field signs uh, to identify uh, them by. And um, again, it's more to do with reading the guides yourself, trying to identify where, uh, where they might be, and then going out and looking for those uh, particular species. I'm just going to take a, a, a glass of water because my, my voice seems to be going a bit. So the first uh, species I'm looking at is the badger. And the slides um, show uh, the paw prints of the badger. It's a very big animal. It's quite uh, heavy. And so any prints that you see on the ground are likely to be sort of quite depressed into the ground, depending on the substrate. What we've got on the left-hand side is actually a print of uh, an actual paw of, of uh, a badger that was actually killed. But <clears throat> I wanted to show this because if you actually look at your own left hand, um, you'll be able to see a similarity. You'll be able to see the fingers, our own fingers actually form an arch as they do with the badger print. And then also your thumb is also similar to what a, a badger has. So you can see on the, um, if I just move my cursor a bit, you can see the thumb here and you can see the toes here. And you can see these massive claws here that are used for all the digging that they do. And if we actually look at an, uh, an actual print on the ground, you can see the thumbprint there. And you can see some of the toe prints here. So although they've got five, they're five, they are a five-toed animal, sometimes you don't always see the number of toes that they've got. So you have to use your deduction, use your evaluation to actually deduce whether this is a badger print or not. Um, they've got a very large central section here, and you can see that also in the actual uh, pole here. Uh, so these are key features to look out for. The other thing about badgers is that um, because of their diet, they need to defecate a lot. And they do that in uh, places called latrines, usually. A, la a latrine can be a shallow depression in the ground that they dig, uh, similar to a cat, and they actually deposit their feces in that. So in the photograph on the right, you can see several of these small depressions where you've got these areas of feces that have been deposited. So this, these can be separate, or alternatively, you can get an area of uh, feces that have been deposited one on top of each other. And I've used uh, both of these photographs really to show the consistency of the feces, um, which some of them are solid and some of them are not so solid. And it just depends on what they've been eating. So the main part of the diet are worms and um, it does depend partly on how hydrated or dehydrated they are. So when you look at the field guides, uh, you might see a, uh, not so much a photograph, but a drawing of a faeces, and it might not look anything like what you actually see out on the site. So do look at some of the photographs that have been taken by surveyors to actually make that deduction. Um, but they, they are quite, obvious when you do see them. And the fact that there is a, um, a shallow depression in which they put those feces is a telltale sign. And usually you can define that from normal uh, dog poo that you might see. Where they live is another key feature. So the badger set is, uh, because they're a large animal, they need to dig out lots of material. So a lot of the sets have uh, these mounds of earth um, at their entrances. And you might find certainly more than one hole um, to in, in, um, in their sets. The sets can uh, have been recorded up to 100 holes 
in the countryside and even in Leicester uh, where I work then we've had whole, uh, we've had sets of up to 40 holes so they do actually support quite a large number of, of uh, badgers um, in their supporting chambers and tunnels that all interconnect to each other. You might also see um, piles of vegetation like this dry grass here uh, where they roll out the, the grass, which is part of their bedding, to wear it out and then to, um, to, uh, to take it back in when it's dry and, and keep themselves warm and dry. The fox is, is a very easily identified animal. Uh, it's a four-toed toed animal with very sharp claws. The photograph on the right is of the... Um, is a fox brain and you can see these sort of big claws, uh, particularly in the in the sort of central uh, toes. Uh, this is a four print. Uh, the picture here is actually of a dog print. So actually do familiarize yourself with domestic animals like dogs and cats so that you don't confuse them. And often the print, the paw prints of a dog do actually show, show the claws on the print as well. Another telltale sign is that the fox print is actually symmetrical. So you can actually draw a line in between and it won't cross over the, um, the, the toe pads. Um, and if you were to draw a line across, horizontally across the, uh, the pad from one claw to another, it shouldn't actually touch through the toe pads either. Whereas actually if you did the same on a dog print, then it would be crossing over those pads. So there's certain ways that you can, um, you can tell uh, one apart from the other. Um, the fox poo is, is uh, quite variable as well, depending on their diet. Uh, I've given the sizes uh, here on the screen as well. Um, quite often they have a sort of a tapered, a sort of curled end to, um, to their poo very similar to uh, other mustelids like stoats and weasels, but sometimes it's actually quite solid. Um, and the darker it is, generally, the fresher it is. So once it gets to looking a bit greyish, um, it's quite, it, it can be quite old and it's been washed out by the, the sunlight and the, um, the rain. Another feature of foxes is, is a fox kill. Um, they, they will go after fairly easy prey like uh, big fat wood pigeons, as we've got here on the left hand side. And you can, you can tell the difference between a fox kill and a, a raptor kill just because the actual wings and parts of the bird are actually kept fairly intact. And um, they will take the animal apart by using their side teeth. So they will actually bite into the into the prey and they will tug it apart and actually shear um, the, the, in this case, the bird quills apart. So often you get almost like a hollow end to those bird quills, um, which is, is a telltale sign. The other thing that you can do is actually get, uh, or kill two birds with one stone, I guess, um, is actually looking at the type of species of bird that, in this case, that they've killed. And this is a woodcock that has been killed, so which is actually quite a nice other species to record. Um, so, so do look out for those as well. Um, I'm conscious of the time because I seem to be sort of spending quite a long time on each slide. So what I'm going to do is, is sort of quickly go through and speed things up a little bit and then maybe actually miss out some of the, the species that I'm talking about and then be able, it will be able to uh, go back and look at them later. I'm just conscious of the time to, to give us for any questions and answers that, uh, that I can give at the end. So the otter was uh, a species that was um, endangered uh, and uh, very few of them existed, particularly in the 1930s because of persecution. But they were reintroduced um, across the country uh, during the 80s and 90s. And they, it's been one of the most successful uh, reintroductions. Uh, you would look for this species around watercourses, around the edges of watercourses. Um, they're very good swimmers and you can look for their paw prints. Um, they are a fi another five-toed animal 
but it's unlikely that you will be able to see their thumbprint as well. You can just about make the thumbprint out here, but you can clearly see the other four prints in this arc and their toe prints tend to be almost like a teardrop shape. But remember to look out for them near to watercourses. So if you see something like this and it's nowhere near water, it's very unlikely to be um, an otter. The, the poo that they uh, deposit uh, they, is called a sprint. They use, they use this as a marking of, for their territory and to tell other otters where they are. Uh, either for mating or as purely as a territorial uh, way of fending off other uh, males in particular. Um, the sprint is full of fish and crustaceans. Um, that's the main part of their diet. It can be dark and tarry, as it is here on the left, or it can be sort of quite grey looking. Um, and often you find them on uh, bridge abutments uh, near to weirs where the stone uh, protruding rocks and stones in watercourses um, and you might find several dollops of it if it's a regular place where the otters uh, go in and out of the water. It smells of sweet jasmine tea or freshly mown grass so it's actually quite pleasant to to smell unlike the mink scat which is completely vile. So you would certainly be able to tell the difference between the two just by actually smelling the, uh, the scat or the sprain. The fish, sorry, the feeding remains are actually quite telling of whether it's a otter or not. Uh, fish remains like the fish over here, uh, can, you can clearly see the remains of the fish here and lots of fish scales are the telltale sign. You might see fish heads and, and tails as well. Uh, you've got uh, crayfish here, if there's crayfish abundance. Usually American signals are the sort of more ro robust crayfish, so they're, they're a tasty morsel for the, for the otters. And we've got some freshwater uh, mussels here. Again, sort of empty, empty shells of the, the, the mussels, the telltale signs that you can see. And usually nearby, you might find um, a sprint and then, hey, bingo, you've got uh, a good uh, identification of a mammal there. Uh, the lager morphs, um, rabbits and hares are the, the main species that we, we have. The European rabbit and the brown hare are the ones that we have in our area. Um, the rabbit, uh, it's unlikely that you will see the prints unless there's some snow. Um, we might have some snow forecast this Friday. So if we do, then please do go out and try and identify some, uh, some rabbit prints. Uh, they tend to bound, as, as most of you will know. So they put their four, four, print, uh, four paws out and then they jump and the, the hind paws will, will join that. So you tend to get all four intermittently in a row. Uh, you've probably gone out and you've seen many of the the little uh, depressions in the ground with the, uh, with the, the, the pellets, um, quite small pellets, uh, quite sweet smelling, uh, like a sweet digestive biscuit, uh, not unpleasant, found uh, near to depressions in the ground where they've been nibbling the, the grass or at the edges of fields. So, so they're the main ID features there. And similarly with the hair, slightly larger, um, droppings, uh, quite similar to, to the rabbit. So sometimes it's quite difficult to, to tell them apart, but having a, a, that ruler next to them would, would help with verification. And the, the other main feature of the hair is their form, which is their lying up area. So here, if I put my cursor around this area, you can actually see the area where they've been lying up. And quite often, if you're walking through a, an open grass field of long grass, you might either see these depressions in the ground or you might actually see the hair. And the hair will actually stay as still as they can, hoping that you'll walk past and not see them um, because that's their defense mechanism. And then at the last minute, they might sort of jump away. So um, if, you, if you see them, do take a picture of the form as well. Um, because it's a good ID feature that you can check up on later. 
Youngerlets are the, the deer uh, species and, and the boar. Um, if you do want to uh, uh, look for red deer and fallow deer, then go to Bradgate Park. That's the go-to place. Lots and lots of poo there, lots and lots of prints. And just to get your eye in there with the type and size of the prints and the poo is good because then that will help inform you when you go out to the wider countryside and you maybe look for roe deer and muntjac deer. The Chinese water deer is found mainly in East Anglia. So again, we don't have to worry too much about that. And the wild boar, we don't, we don't have any in our area either. I have to say that, that deer species are particularly difficult to identify out um, in, the, in the wild. Uh, they've all got these dark type of droppings and it's the size and shape of the droppings that really give it away. Um, but the, the, the roe deer in particular have these sort of pointed ends, almost like a, a miniature bishop mitre's hat. Um, and they have larger footprints. Um, they're a medium sized deer, quite dainty. Um, but if you see the two close together, don't just, don't just count on the, the field signs of the pellets. Look for the prints as well in bits of mud, in next to puddles, next to um, field edges and, and in woodlands and, and try and make that deduction. It's always good if you can back it up with actually seeing the animal or, you know, or capturing it on camera as well. And that again sort of helps with the confidence in identification. Um, monk jack, you are very likely to come across these field prints. Uh, they seem to be everywhere across the Charmwood area. Um, their prints are very small, only two, meter, two centimetres wide and three or four centimetres long. Uh, you tend to find them very close together, again on the edges of uh, grass fields, agricultural fields, um, readily in, in, on sort of woodland edges. Um, the photograph here is, is quite uh, uh, fresh uh, droppings, um, which tend to sort of look quite rounded, but as they dry off, they, they shrivel and they become quite dimpled. And again, they've got these sharp points here. And, and when they shrivel up, they become the size of like a dried pea. So that's about the size. So you can tell that, you know, this is a small animal that will poo out fairly small pellets and then they will dry up even smaller. So again, look out for these species. Um, and they are fairly red, readily recognizable. Um, through their, their prints. The rodents, that there's very, very, a lot of them. Obviously, they're, they're the bottom of the food chain uh, for many prey species. Um, the gray squirrels, you're much more likely to see them out on, on site, uh, see them uh, scurrying up trees, uh, being quite noisy. Um, so I'm not going to go into the field signs for that. Um, the dormice, we don't have any in our area at the moment. Um, but I am going to talk about bank voles and I am going to talk about water voles in particular and, and wood mice. So the water vole again is an, an endangered species, but it has some readily identifiable field signs that I think you could all feel confident in identifying once, once you, you, you get your eye in, uh, partly because it's only found very close to water up to two meters away from water is the maximum it would, uh, the field science would be found. Um, it's gone through a terrific decline during the eighties and nineties, but in, in our area, we are getting some, uh, some sightings and some records of them in areas where they either, they haven't been recorded before or they have uh, made a comeback in that particular area. And our latest record is actually on the Rothley Brook round about Switzerland, uh, where a lady saw one of these, uh, it, it, or thought she saw she, a water bowl. So we still need to identify that and verify it through uh, field signs. So your help in going out there and, and helping to uh, look along the Rothley Brook will be greatly appreciated. The field sign, the main field sign is their, their droppings. They're cylindrical in shape, as opposed to a brown rat having sharp ends. Uh, they don't smell because they're herbivores. Uh, they're greenish or slightly purplish in color. Uh, purple if they've, 
been eating berries like elderberries and blackberries, but generally they're green in colour because uh, they eat a lot of vegetation. In the picture here, they're actually eating a, a red clover. <clears throat> they use them to mark their own territories or to act as a, uh, <clears throat> a latrine where you will get piles of droppings, one on top of another, uh, some of them quite squashed down where they've actually trodden over them. But uh, again, if you find a latrine like this, then you've certainly got waterfalls in the area. <clears throat> the other telltale signs of their burrows uh, found quite close to the water's edge as they are here. And some of them will be under the water's edge where they actually use that as a, an escape mechanism where they can dip down into the burrow and then they can actually go out into the water and actually swim away from danger. And then these two um, photographs on the right are of grazed burrows um, where they're actually maternity burrows where uh, the mother will have their young. And then instead of actually leaving the burrow and leaving their young more vulnerable, they will actually eat the vegetation around the burrow uh, to help to survive. Um, and that seems almost counterintuitive because you think, well, the, the burrow is going to be more noticeable uh, to other species, but you know, it seems to work in, in, in the, uh, the mother being able to defend her young. Um, so they're, they're actually quite noticeable. They're a little bit smaller than a tennis ball, um, if you think about the shape of and size of a water bowl, it's about the shape and size of a guinea pig. So think about what can go in and out of those holes. And the other main feature is, is what they eat. As I said, it's, it's mainly vegetation. We've got examples of grasses here and uh, they leave a 45 degree angle when they actually eat their, their grasses. It's just to do with the way they hold them. Uh, hold the grass and they nibble them and uh, if they're comfortable in the area that they they um they they feed then they will leave these quite large piles of vegetation and again it's a very much a telltale sign usually found right right next to the water level and uh you will you will be able to see these quite readily and using a, that stick to actually move overlying vegetation away is a very, very good way of actually sort of spotting them where they might otherwise be hidden. <clears throat> the harvest mouse, the main ID feature is the nests, uh, usually found between 40, uh, 40 centimeters and a meter above ground, um, made up of grasses. Uh, so moving swiftly on, uh, there's a, a field chart here that you can use to decipher whether it's a harvest mouse nest, a dormouse nest in areas where we might have dormice, or actually a, a waterfowl nest. Um, so that's quite a useful thing to use as well. And then last but not least, moving swiftly to the end, is uh, just two other rodents. And I use this because this is a way of you going out into a woodland area and being able to just pick up some, in this case, pine cones or hazelnuts and being able to either ID them on site or take them away. And you can do this at any time. Um, so the pine cones here, it looks like somebody's been eating them with, um, by using a technique almost like eating corn on the cob. And this is a typical field sign of the wood vole, uh, sorry, a wood mouse, uh, to confuse it, a wood mouse, which um, they leave the ends of the, the cone in, intact and they just eat the, the main part of the cone. You often find them uh, in piles like this, usually in sort of quite discrete areas uh, because it's quite a large piece of, of food for them to eat and they need to feel safe uh, when they're, they're doing it. So they'll drag the cones into that safe area and then they'll eat them. And then the, the way uh, that they gnaw hazelnuts is also quite uh, defined. So they usually do more or less a circular hole and they they hold it in both hands uh, both paws and then they they move the the hazelnut around in their in their paws and as they're doing so they will gnaw a hole around and actually eat the inside of the nut and whilst they're gnawing around that hole then they leave these small indentations 
on the inner ring of the hole, but also they, they leave a marked appearance on the outer edge of the hole. Whereas the bunk vole will do the same thing by holding the hazelnut, but they will only leave marks on the inner section of the, of the rim of the hazelnut. <clears throat> so the, the using a, a handless lens in this case, certainly with my eyesight, helps to identify whether it's a wood mouse or a, uh, or a bunk vole. Um, dormice nibble in, in different ways, and it's a key feature of identifying whether you've got dormice in the area. Uh, but for our purposes and in the counties, uh, in the county and in Charnwood that we're looking at, then these are the, the key features. So I've hastily brought things to a close and we've still got five minutes. So uh, I'd like to hand back to Claire now to, uh, to take things from there. So if I just stop sharing my screen. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Helen. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, the difference. Uh, who knew that you kind of look at look at little tiny nuts and try and look at the teeth uh, and see uh, see which species been nibbling away. So that is uh, that really interesting. Thanks ever so much for that run through. Thank you for keeping to time. Um, so I'll open up the floor. <laughs> yes, oh, brilliant. Um, I'll open up the floor if anyone's got any questions. If you want to raise your hand or pop something in the chat or just shout out. Linda, I've got you with your hand up there. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Helen. That was a really good talk. Um, I'd like to ask about, um, in my garden I have a pond and there's a little um, vole that I think is a, a field vole. vole. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I tell, it's, it's a bank vole, it's not the same as a field vole, is it, or is it? It's no. a bank vole, right. No, 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 they are two different, um, uh, different species. Yeah. They have slightly different coloured um, pelages or fur, and their um, their ears protrude slightly differently. Now, right. the the fur and the and the ears are difficult features to identify um, when you're you you're looking at them. I I can only say look at some some guidebooks. Um, right. and try and get a greater um you know sort of maybe a photograph um if you can get a photograph or if you've got if you've got a wildlife camera put yeah. that up and then if you want to send it through to me I, I will probably be able to confirm one way or the other yeah the thing about about field voles and bank vole generally and this is generally because they're wild animals and they'll do whatever they want to do then generally a bank vole will be associated with sort of shady areas and, and undercover areas. Mm -hmm. um, and they will, uh, they, 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 they are readily found in gardens because of hedgerows and, and shrubs and such like. If you've got large areas of grass, um, mm -hmm. then you might also have field voles. And field voles are generally associated with meadow areas and grass areas. And mm -hmm. field voles are seed eaters. Um, yeah. So if you were to get a skull of a bank vole in the field vole, you could actually look at the teeth and you would be able, be able to de define as well whether it's one or the other. Okay. Um, my, my feeling is it's probably a, a bank vole. Um, certainly we've got bank voles in our garden here and they regularly come out, uh, but it can be actually a little bit difficult. Yeah, um, yeah, this this one definitely eats seeds because it's it's I, I put the bird food out and I've got a, like a log and it's yeah. by a pond and it comes out and it eats seeds. Yes. Yeah. But I that, mean, they, they both they do both eat seeds as well. But yeah. um, okay. the other thing that you can do is actually put a small mammal trap out yeah. and they, they do readily go into mammal traps. And then by actually doing that, you'd be able to, you know, get it into a bag and then have a proper look at it and get some close up photographs as well. So yeah. that might actually be a nice little project for you to do yeah. and actually then get to the, the bottom of it, you know, yeah. actually identify it, you know, and, yeah. and think, right, I know what you are now. They're so, so quick. Yeah. And uh, yes, I've been reporting the biddle. Definitely. Like. So yeah. either on camera or or maybe in a little or, one uh, chart, would actually oh, help. Help yeah. with that ID. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. We've got a couple um, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Stella says, is there anywhere to record roadkill? Um, yes, there, there is. A nature spot will readily take those records. Um, the, the hard thing about roadkill is actually uh, if you're speeding along the A46 or the A50 in particular, sort of for the area that we're, we're looking at, and it's actually near to where I live, it's very difficult to actually uh, work out where you've actually seen it if you're not able to write it down because you're the one that's driving. So, um, yes, do send in those records, um, it, particularly because they might be quite large animals. They might be badgers or foxes or deer that you see uh, that you'll be able to readily um, identify and if you try and make a note of the nearest junction or a bridge that you might be driving over nearby you can then actually look at an aerial photograph on uh, say find the grid reference uh, which is a useful website where you can then actually work out where the um, where the animal is that you've seen or you can go into nature spot and you can use their aerial photographs to try and identify it so accuracy of the location is important. And then, um, you know, actually getting the, the ident identification correctly is, is also important. But Nature Spot, yes, will we'll accept those records. And then people like myself will, um, will, will readily, um, you know, verify them. Uh, and quite frequently, I do get sent some quite gory photographs um, to identify, which, you know, is just the nature of the job, I guess, but it does provide us with some important records. Um, the only thing is with Nature Spot, they obviously won't put the gory records on because they don't want to, to put people off and it, and it can actually be quite unpleasant. But for people like myself, you know, that's what we're here to do. So I'm, I'm quite prepared to, you know, to accept records. If you do want to send anything through directly to me, if you prefer to do that, then my email address for the mammal group is, is on the front slide and you can do that or you can send them via Claire if she's willing to accept these gory photos yes, and we'll, we'll do it one way or the other. Brilliant. But do thank keep you. sending them in, that's the important thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just a note that I was thinking about while you were talking as well, Helen, that um, absolutely we're encouraging you to go out and record, but please do be aware of health and safety. Um, when you're obviously um, nearby any of the main roads, really just don't put yourself in any kind of danger. And also a lot of the water courses as well. So if you're trying to get a good look at what might be an otter print under a bridge, just don't, don't whatever you do, fall down the bank and into the river. So yeah. um, do please take care um, when you're out and about doing any kind of recording. Um, so another question here, um, somebody says, if we're recording species, Jackie, um, if we're recording species on Manmore Mapper, should we also put it elsewhere on Nature Spot or I record separately? Um, you don't, you don't need to. Um, Manmore Mapper, there's always a worry of, of duplication and it's, and it's, it's almost like, you know, we want to make sure it is recorded and not forgotten about. But we've been given assurance by the Mammal Society that they will share those records. So when they put them on the National Biodiversity Network, they become they, they go out into the public domain so anybody can view them. And it's important for that because they're, they're used by universities for research and you know for all sorts of different purposes. Um, we then have a um, an arrangement with our local record office, uh, the Leicestershire and Rutland Environmental Resource Centre, um, and the records are shared with, with them via the MBN, by the uh, uh, National Biodiversity Network. And then they will come through to, to, to the county mammal recorder. So in a roundabout way, it, they will end up with the county mammal recorder and then we can make sense of them. Likewise, it goes the other way around. So if we record them locally, uh, any mammal records that are recorded through the mammal group or through um, Nature Spot um, or directly through to the record centre, they will then get loaded up onto the National Biodiversity Network. And so they will be shared out into the public domain. So it's very important when we, we look at our data that it's not just squirreled away, for want of a better word, and put into a bookshelf and, and just forgotten about. This is about using the data and making it work for conservation. And uh, I think as, as part of our 
ethos it's about sharing and raising awareness and and this is the process to to go to go down uh, and, and use it these days brilliant thank you yeah and i think um if you saw dave nichols presentation about nature spot and how you could sign up um in, if you're using the iRecord app you can select Nature Spot as the place to send your records directly from yeah. iRecord. You can also pick the Charmwood project as well when you're using iRecord or Nature Spot. So um, that will help us to tie down the fact that you're um, you kind of got cracking with your recording as a result of this project. Yeah. So, um, and as Helen said, all the records then do get shared um, with national databases. Yeah. I did, can I just add to that, Claire, that mm. I, th I think sometimes because the Mammal Society does so much and it is a charity and they've developed this app, there's almost like a feeling of allegiance, you know, with, with well, where do I record it? And, and similarly with Nature Spot, I, I've used Nature Spot quite a lot over the last year because I wanted to, increase the number of mammal records on, you know, support them and actually get the information out there more readily for people who might want to access Nature Spot as opposed to going through a record centre or going onto a national database where there's, there's lots of complicated species to look at and, and trying to identify well, what's in our area can be more difficult. So I'd say do what you feel comfortable with um, if you if you've got space on your phone and you want to download the, the mammal mapper, it's worth doing it because you will get to know what they're doing um, and, and maybe find that actually quite a useful tool. Or likewise, you might think, no, it's not for me. I'll stick to, lo to the local stuff. Um, so we're not saying one way or the other, you know, don't use this or don't use that. Just feel what, what you feel comfortable in doing. Yeah. Um, and I think just having a balance of, of how you, you might use Nature Spot one, one day, you might use uh, the Mammal Tracker another day. Um, but the beauty of the Mammal Tracker is that you do get that complete survey if you want to put your location on your phone. Uh, whereas for the other devices, um, and certainly for, for just recording um, the location of, of a particular um, field sign that you've seen, we don't get the overarching picture, whereas with the mammal tracker you do. Absolutely, yeah, it's that kind of negative record, kind of yeah. not seeing stuff is, is really important, um, yeah. so that we know where species aren't as well as where they are, or at least if you've been looking for them. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions or a question and uh, somebody's given us an answer so that you may, you may have a comment on this about stoats and weasels. What are the differences? Um, and Jackie said, uh, a rhyme from Eden in Blyton, stoat can easily be told from the weasel by the simple fact that its tail is blacked and its figure is slightly the bigger. What do we think about stoats and weasels? Go for it. No, no, I think I think I, if this is Jackie that I know, she, she's a member of the mammal group, and yes, I would I would I would totally agree with what Jackie said. It's the, the telltale sign, telltale sign is the actual the little black tip on the on the stoat, uh, which will give it away. I think the problem is is that if the stoat's behind a rock, then you might not actually see that little black tip on the tail. Um, if you were to see them side by side, again, you will be easily, easily be able to tell that um, it's, a, it's a, a stoat if it's much larger, as opposed to a weasel. So do, do think about the other thing, think about how the gait of the animals. Uh, the weasels tend to travel very close to the ground, very quickly along the, the bottom of the ground, uh, close to, to the floor. Um, so quite often they're seen scurrying across the road, um, whereas the stoats do have much more of a, a lolloping, they're, they're a bigger animal, so they're much more of a lolloping um, type of gait, um, where they're, they're, they're running to, to push their, their forepaws up and then uh, using their back paws to, um, to move along. So actually just looking at how, how, uh, how the two animals are, uh, interacting you know they might be looking for prey they might be totally oblivious to to where you are but they um they they would uh they would be behaving in a different way um, and the other thing about stoats is that they have uh, they do actually develop a winter coat uh, the ermine coat which is becoming less and less obvious uh, because of our seasons being intermixed but during the winter you might see um a stoat with a slightly sort of beigey colour 
um, sort of off brown or a tan coloured uh, type of coat as opposed to the normal sort of dark russety type coat um, that you would see and associate with with later in spring and summer. Um, so that's just just uh, another ID feature that you might pick up on. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. So some really good uh, ID, ID tips there. And um, yes, the Enid Light and Rhyme does seem to work uh, and looking for the black tip. Have we got any other questions? I know somebody had their hand up, but it seems to have gone away. So if you did have your hand up, um, do, do try again. If you've still got a question, I'll pop it in the chat. Uh, oh, Louise, I think that was me. Okay, Louise, hopefully we've sorted out your spoken music question. That's brilliant. Well, if nobody else has got any questions, um, we're only 10 minutes over, so, but I think that's been really, really fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us, Helen. Um, and I hope everybody's enjoyed it. I will send round links uh, and the link to the recording if anybody wants to look back on any of it. Um, so as, as ever, it doesn't happen straight away. We just have to wait for the, the link to get through the system. Um, so give me a few days to perhaps into next week uh, and I will email around to everybody. So you've all got the details. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, another one next month. I think we'll still be on Zoom in March, but I'm very much hoping um, perhaps by May time that we might actually be able to get out and do some um, field sessions over the summer. So um, do watch this space, watch your emails uh, and watch the usual kind of websites and social medias. Um, but for now, I shall finish the webinar here. And thank you once again to everybody and have thank a lovely uh, rest of the day. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, thanks. Bye, now. See you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.